Alors, bonjour à tout le monde et merci d'être des nôtres pour ce concert Firestone euh, virtuel avec Causerie et Cocktail. Mon nom est Véronique Couillard et il me fait vraiment plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue. Hello and thank you for joining us for this Firestone um, virtual concert with discussion and cocktail. Um, this is part of our annual Firestone in Conversation series. Before introductions, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the beautiful Anishinaabe Aki territory. The Anishinaabe have been on this territory known uh, as the city of Ottawa uh, since the beginning of time. All sorts of art form have been and continue and will continue to be part of the vibrant Anishinaabe culture. J'aimerais prendre un moment pour saluer la nation Anishinaabe. Nous nous trouvons sur ces terres non cédées, qui a fourni à la culture de nombreuses sources d'inspiration et qui continue de le faire et continuera de le faire pour les années à venir. I also want to take a moment to thank our funders. Je prends donc un moment pour remercier nos bailleurs de fonds, la Ville d'Ottawa, le Conseil des arts de l'Ontario, et le Conseil des arts du Canada. Je passe maintenant la parole à Alexandra Badzak, Director and CEO of the Ottawa Art Gallery. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Beho, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I know that the people from, from all across Canada are joining us, but in Ottawa, we have a beautiful day, and so thank you for sharing it with us tonight. This event honors the legacy of Isabel Firestone and her contribution to the arts in Ottawa, both as an arts collector and for her involvement in the music scene. I'm joined by my colleague, Rebecca Bassiano. Rebecca is the curator of the Firestone Gallery exhibition, Recollecting, uh, the group of seven celebrating a, a hundred years, which explores the group of seven in terms of their relationship and kind of through the lens of the collectors, Isabel and OJ Firestone. Uh, Rebecca and I will chat about uh, the Firestone collection to provide context, We'll dig into the atmosphere in which the uh, collection was amassed over the years and highlight Isabel's uh, contribution. So in discussion with their daughter, Brenda Firestone, Rebecca and I felt it was really timely to dedicate a Firestone chat to her mother, Isabel, uh, who was as pivotal to this important uh, public collection as her husband. Uh, and I know Brenda is joining us in, in the audience tonight. Uh, Isabel Firestone was born in 1913 uh, she passed away in 2002 and was born in Ottawa to Jewish immigrants who had fled uh, the programs in uh, Russia in the early 20th century. Uh, she grew up in a vibrant Jewish community located in the Byward Market and studied to be a concert pianist. In 1947, she married O.J. Firestone, who came to Canada from Vienna in the 1930s, and they began collecting artwork together, amassing over 1,600 artworks of modern art uh, which has now come, become known as the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art, which the Ottawa Art Gallery has the honour of being a steward of. Um, historically, Isabel has been underrecognized to some degree as the co-collector compared to her husband. So Rebecca, perhaps you can speak to the significant role that she played in amassing this important collection. Of course, yeah, thanks Alex. So, um... We're going to start with this beautiful picture here, which is of Isabel uh, sitting at her piano in her living room. And she's sitting in front of an artwork by Claude Pichet called Fir Trees Running in the Snow. So although it was OJ who networked with artists and collectors during his business travels across the country, it really was both Isabel and OJ who visited artist studios, became friends with artists, and developed a mutual love of modern Canadian art. In fact, uh, when they first started out, Isabel taught piano at $1.50 a lesson to help finance their collecting. Uh, they really did sacrifice a lot in the beginning. Um, Isabel said they had no curtains or carpets in their first house uh, in order to put down payments on paintings that they liked. Uh, Isabel always said that you did not need to have a lot of money in order to start your art collection. So obviously, uh, collecting is a very passionate endeavor, and these were two very passionate collectors. And we know that Isabel continued to collect on her own 
even after the large donation of the 1600 works that were made to the Ontario Heritage Foundation and then afterwards the City of Ottawa. Um, and this small private collection of pieces were actually recently donated to the gallery in 2015 by daughter Brenda Firestone. And what's so unique about this is that this private collection gives us a peek into Isabel's personal collecting interests, uh, ones that she did on her own. And so this uh, collection includes the work uh, by Frances Ann Johnston. So those are the two pictures uh, that we're looking at here, although there were others by Frances Ann in this in small collection. And Frances Ann Johnston, I would say as a painter has been largely overshadowed in Canadian art history. Uh, if you wanna draw a parallel to Isabel as well, in terms of as a collector, I mean, women from this period have largely been overshadowed and it's our duty to sort of reclaim them from history. Um, but Frances Ann Johnson was further uh, overshadowed because she was the daughter of Franz Johnson, who uh, is a founding member of the Group of Seven. And uh, she also married an artist as well, Franklin Arbuckle, who was a renowned illustrator. So Isabel's purchase of these works have greatly contributed to our research um, of Canadian art and have inspired me uh, to undertake a large feminist recovery project bringing to light uh, the underrepresentation of uh, Frances Ann Johnson. So um, next year, stay tuned uh, for an exhibition and publication uh, of her work. Okay, so as Isabel and OJ's collection increased, they began planning for the construction of their residence at 375 Minto Place in 1960. And actually this house was named Belle Manor after Isabel or Bella. Um, and at the time, it had temperature and humidity controls, special lighting for exhibition purposes. Uh, there were commissioned sculptures for the grounds. And it really was a modern design in a neighborhood full of very traditional Tudor homes. And this is the living room of that home. And it was the focal point uh, of the house, I would say. And it was where Isabel played her piano daily. And you can see uh, from the first image I showed you, actually, the piano there in the left bottom corner, her white baby grand, and that Claude Boucher work. And so she's playing her piano daily surrounded by their collection. And then you can also see a Franz Johnston uh, work, that blue work in the corner with the trees. So while this living room was where OJ would give tours to the public, um, it was also where Isabel hosted and played music for gatherings of artists, for actors, and for musicians. Yeah, you can just imagine that atmosphere, how extraordinary that that would have been. And I've often had conversations uh, with Brenda Firestone about how magical that must have been as, as a child to, to see all of those famous uh, artists and musicians come through. We currently have an exhibition, as we mentioned, on view in the Firestone Gallery, recollecting the Group of Seven celebrating 100 years. Uh, and the design of this exhibition is really reminiscent of that Firestone living room that you showed us. So when you were curating the show, Rebecca, why was it important to kind of evoke that atmosphere? What components directly reference the original Firestone family home? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, as I said, the Firestones were surrounded by and lived very intimately with their collection. And I really wanted to showcase and bring that into the gallery space. So architectural design aspects of the home that were brought in are, you can see the teak wood that is around the top of the gallery space and then those curtains on the right. And then here we go, here's OJ giving one of his tours and you can see the exact same elements there, that teak wood that sort of brings it down into this comfortable home environment. Um, and these teak elements were also incorporated into the design of the OEG as a whole. So for those of you who are familiar, when you come into our Mackenzie King lobby and you look up at the Firestone Gallery, the outside is completely clad in that teak wood. And um, in addition, the, uh, as you can see here, the original uh, staircase from the actual home, which was recovered by the gallery before the house was demolished, uh, is incorporated into the design of the OAG as well, leading visitors from the Mackenzie King lobby right up to our dedicated Firestone Gallery. So back into the interior of the exhibition space, um, the furniture uh, is not the exact same as what's in their home, but we did try to find pieces that were 
similar funky colors that evoke that mid-century modern design, the, the bright orange and the bright purple. Um, a design that's very in right now, very into mid-century modern. Um, and then a further detail is the screen, the window coverings or the screens that were in the home. So if you look at the top left, that's the gallery, that's the exhibition. And then the top right, that's a screen that was actually on the inside of their home. Um, and then on the outside of the Firestone home, there was these um, concrete blocks that had these really unique uh, patterns in them. And we brought that into the gallery space as well, if you see on the bottom left image. Now in this slide, you see on the left a bookcase and on it are photographs of both Isabel and OJ sort of meeting artists at having those gatherings that we were talking about before. And underneath you see a picture of um, paintings like they were bursting at the seams with art in their house. And so you have, you know, in a bedroom, you have paintings leaning against the furniture and, and such. So I tried to really bring that into the gallery space. If we just want to go back one more slide. I wanted to show on the right that um, we have that sort of bookcase again. And uh, we did bring in those reproductions sort of leaning just to create that that atmosphere, of course. Those are reproductions on the floor. Everything else in the gallery is original, but um, just for the safety of the artwork. But uh, yeah, it sort of evokes that feeling of bursting at the seams and yeah. And then yeah, the next slide here, because they had so much artwork and it was just proliferated all over the home, the general salon style display of exhibition uh, and artwork hanging, I brought into the show as well. So um, they had two rooms in their house. Um, one that was devoted to A.Y. Jackson and one that was devoted to A.J. Catherine. Um, of course, the, art, the rest of the artwork was throughout, but then these rooms were completely dedicated to these artists. So the one that we're looking at here on the top is the room that was dedicated to A.J. Catherine. Um, and rooms dedicated to a group of seven members like those were actually the basis of this show. It was to show the group of seven and to celebrate them, but from Isabel and O.J.'s particular perspective. Um, the group of seven actually makes up the largest representation in the collection, forming 40% of the holdings. So that's over 600 works. And while the Firestones developed great relationships with the majority of the artists who they collected, they were particular friends with Jackson and Casson. Um, and with Casson in particular, and this is why I love this image, is that they tried to collect an artwork from every year of an artist's life, um, which they they tried to do that in a few artist cases, but they, they I think they achieved that with Casson, which is pretty exciting. So I had the uh, lucky opportunity of going through over 140 works by Casson uh, downstairs in the vault and uh, picking out the, the small collection, which you can see at the bottom image. And what I did is I picked a, a work from every decade between 1917 in 1980 of his career. And, you know, the Firestones always knew that this collection was going to be uh, a research collection, it was going to be for the public. And that so it's really interesting to see how an artist progresses throughout their career. And in this case, you can see very visibly, even from this small image, that his boards get larger over time. Um, so here's a that classic image of the group of seven. So again, the exhibition uh, was showcasing them from Isabel and OJ's perspective, but we were really doing it to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the group. Because the first exhibition by the Group of Seven was actually 100 years ago in 1920 at the Art Gallery of Toronto, where they started putting out their national vision um, for uh, the Canadian landscape. And what's really exciting is that in celebration of the 100th anniversary, Canada Post issued seven new stamps um, featuring artworks by original members of the group. And the set includes a work from Isabel and OJ's collection. So it's this work here by uh, Franklin Carmichael, and it's called In the Nickelbelt. And I think this is actually one of Carmichael's most important works. Uh, you can see here, like among the hills of rock, a billow of rising smoke dominates the skyline and it, re it reflects Carmichael's reverence for the Northern Ontario landscape, but it also shows a critique of environmental destruction through industry. 
Um, the intense organic forms and the rich colors are very characteristic of the group of seven, but it also shows Carmichael's particular sense of composition and design. So while this work was executed almost 100 years ago, in the face of climate change, the significance of this work continues to be relevant for contemporary audiences. Um, and another fun fact about this piece is that it's actually in Europe right now, which is, which is pretty exciting, uh, for a celebratory exhibition called Magnetic North, Canadian Modern Painting, an exhibition uh, co-organized by the Schoen Frankfurt, the National Gallery of Canada, and the Art Gallery of Ontario. So it's very exciting to see an artwork collected by and treasured by Isabel and OJ going from the interior of their home to becoming this national symbol. So it's a, a, such a wonderful way to put it. Uh, and, and how amazing, again, it must have been to live with these works. Uh, and so how wonderful it is that they're now shared uh, with, with all of you. And so we definitely do encourage you to book your, your visit at the OAG because we are uh, opened and uh, you get a chance to see the, the incredible show uh, that Rebecca was able to pull, uh, pull together. So Rebecca, in the same way that art really infiltrated every corner of the house, so did Isabel's music. Uh, and part of your exhibition really includes a soundscape of Chopin's piano music because it was Isabel's favorite composer. He was Isabel's favorite composer. Can you really take us through and, and give us a little bit more information uh, about Isabel's musical background? Yeah, sure. Well, like you said, music definitely informed how one experienced art in the Firestone household, which is why I included that soundscape. So a little bit of the background from an early age, Isabel showed an interest in music. Her father was an accomplished Bella Leica player, and I just learned that is a Russian triangular stringed instrument, a very cool instrument. So her father played, and then she began studying piano as a very young girl, discovering that it was a lifelong passion of hers. So in her teens, Isabel became a pupil of Ottawa pianist and educator Gladys Ewart. So under this mentor, Isabel studied full time and was exposed to the international music world, music history, as well as the world of art, books, and painting. So a little background on Gladys Ewart, who was a, a really big fi figure in uh, Ottawa music. She uh, studied in New York. Um, she was an active concert pianist in all of North America throughout the 20s uh, through to the 40s. And she made numerous appearances as a soloist with the Ottawa Symphony Orchestra. Um, Ewart ran the piano studio in Ottawa for many years. And uh, another one of her pupils was actually Evelyn Greenberg, who if those who are not familiar, spent many years with the music department at the University of Ottawa and is also a performer on the international stage. So with this training from Gladys Ewart, Isabel gave concerts in Ottawa herself um, at locations such as the Chateau Laurier. And I love this um, advert uh, from a 1938 edition of the Ottawa Jewish Bulletin for one of her performances. Um, you can see that she's being referenced as Miss Isabel Toronto, which was her maiden name before she married OJ. So these lessons that she had with Ewart were at 400 Wilbrod Street, this beautiful house that you can see pictured here. It's a Tudor revival style home in Sandy Hill that was built in 1910. It has, as you can see, tall chimneys, six fireplaces, a wood paneled foyer, deep moldings, and a conservatory. I would love to move in. Um, <laughs> the Brazilian government actually later purchased this home in the 1940s, and it's now the um, official residence for Brazilian ambassadors. So a fun fact is that the original Heinzmann piano that belongs to the residence, the piano that Gladys Ewart would have taught and where Isabel would have played, has actually been recently restored and tuned up. And the current ambassadors, Dennis Fontes de Souza Pinto and his wife, Maria, who you can see pictured here uh, with her little dog, Dan, <laughs> uh, they've restored it back to its former glory. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's the, the life of, of these objects like pianos, uh, the, the tales that they could tell. Um, in the same way that you were, was a mentor to Isabel, later in life, 
Isabel really became an active supporter of young musicians. She was a significant donor to the University of Ottawa's music department's capital campaign to build the new uh, music building, Perez Hall. Uh, and her baby white grand piano, uh, which you saw pictures of, is now sitting in one of their practice rooms. Uh, Isabel also created several scholarships in the music department to support um, mus uh, students in their musical studies. Uh, and she was so obviously committed to giving back to her community and, and the music library, in fact, is named after her to honor all of these gifts. So as we wrap up our chat, I think it's really clear that the Firestone family's donation of their art collection to the people of Ottawa, as well as Isabel's personal donation to the musical life at the University of Ottawa have really significantly contributed to the vibrant cultural uh, city that we have here in Ottawa. And we're so pleased to be able to highlight their important legacy. Uh, so I, I thank uh, Rebecca for sharing all of your insights today. It's a really great chat. There's always more and more we can talk and mine from uh, the Firestone collection. Uh, but I'm going to pass it over to you again to discuss the music we're about to hear. Great. So um, we have two recorded performances that we're going to hear today. Um, they are both, as Alex mentioned, by Isabel's favorite composer, Frédéric Chopin. So Frédéric Chopin was a Polish composer of the Romantic period, and all of his compositions include piano and are mostly solo piano. And his pieces are very technically demanding. So our first performance is by Dmitry Ian Prezel, who is a piano performance student at the University of Ottawa under the mentorship of David Gelbert. He completed his Royal Conservatory of Music training in 2016, and he has participated in masterclasses with renowned pianists, participated in many prestigious festivals, and is partaking in competitions such as the Canadian Music Competition, Orchestra Toronto Competition, and the Canada International Piano Competition. So Dimitri will be playing ballad number four in F minor, opus 52. So Chopin's ballad number four um, was completed in 1842 in Paris. Chopin wrote a total of four ballads, this obviously being the last. And Chopin's ballads are known for being quite difficult to play with this fourth one often being considered the most challenging, both technically and musically. The opening sets up something very different from what is to come. And so the piece is full of unpredictable twists and lots of drama. Starting with a short musical motive, Chopin develops two themes that undergo several transformations throughout the piece. So very excited for that. And then the second performance is by, by Chao Ru Liu, who is currently pursuing a Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance at the University of Ottawa under the guidance of Professor David Gelbert. She studied with Dr. Angela Chan and Dr. Wani Song at the Lambada Music School in Montreal. She has performed in master classes with world-renowned pianists, performed at Carnegie Hall in New York, and has won several regional and provincial competitions and was nominated for the Governor General Academic Medal. So she'll be playing Polonez Fantasy and A flat major, opus 61. So a little bit about this piece. It was completed in 1846. Um, it combines the expressive chords and the dance-like qualities of the Polonez with the freer form of the fantasy, leading the listener through several different keys while conveying a bold yet contemplative journey. This piece gradually builds in density and harmonic complexity to a climactic peak. This piece challenges performers technically and represents Chopin's late career. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much also to our colleagues, Vero and Ailey for helping us out. Thanks to Brenda Firestone uh, for your support and insight on your mother's contribution. And of course, a big thanks to the University of Ottawa's music department for our partnership today. I hope you all enjoyed our chat. Uh, and now I encourage you to please relax and enjoy the performances. Good night.